you see the one in the refrigerator? Right there? Hey, hey, hey. Hey, guys, invite your followers, share on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, hello, Apostle Elijah. Endless favor, good to see you. Such a faithful, regular viewer, I appreciate that. Mrs. Garrett, hello. Thank you, guys. Invite your followers, share on Facebook and Twitter. This is going to be excellent tonight. Nikki N7, hello. Jonas01, hello. By Faith, hello. Good evening from Louisiana. Elizabeth, love you. Australia, hi. North Carolina. Um, hey, Scott. A whole church in the city. I miss what you said about Elijah. Oh, this is going to make me burp, but this will do. Thank you. Come on, man. Oh my God, oh my God, it's Tia, hey. Hey, Theante. Let's say hi, Brandon. Hey, y'all. Hey. hey, Vicky. So do me a favor, guys, invite your followers, share on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get this room up and we're going to jump into it. I'm great. Hello from South Carolina. Burp, apostle. <laughs> I'm not burping. <laughs> if I do, it's going to be silent. Hey, everybody. Let's get the room up to 100. Uh, you know a lot of people who need to, to, to hear about this and to be a part of this discussion, so let's get them in here. Liz. Hey, Liz. Liz, did Shamel talk to you yet? She did. She sent a message. Oh, I didn't see that. Okay, good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, come on. Ten more people in the room. We'll get going. No, I'm not. Mm, come get him. Hello there. London's been burning. Oh, wow. It was so great to be with you all. Awesome, 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 awesome. If you haven't already, invite your followers, share on Facebook and Twitter. All right. NYC is here. Hello, NYC. I think that's Amber Lawton's, um, but I love um, Hello. Uh, Carla, she's a, um, a great photographer. She took Makai's um, headshots. I need to get her back in. I keep saying I am. I'm, I'm failing. Pray for me. Okay. Hey, guys. Rock Church is in the house. Okay, let's get started. Invite, invite. Share, share, share. Give lots of hearts throughout this. Okay. My name is Sherman Dumas. And uh, I'm an author, speaker, creative entrepreneur, and pastor of an amazing multi-site church movement called Kingdom Culture Worship Center, um, one church in four different cities in Southern California. But um, that's part of what I do. In addition to what I do is I'm what some people would call a deliverance minister. I, I decided to to coin the phrase um, freedom coach. So, so I help people get free, stay free in their lives is a big part of what I do in my ministry across the world. And, um, and I decided to be able to start hosting um, freedom talks, an opportunity to talk with people who have dealt with different struggles in their lives, who are believers, they're saved, they love the Lord, but they struggle. And, and I want to talk to you all about that because I think it's vitally important for you to understand that salvation is just the first step. But there is so important that we understand that Jesus came to set the captives free, to set the captives free. And so many of us are saved, but then there's still things that have tried to attach itself to our souls, to hold us down, to keep us in bondage. And Jesus came not just to save you, but to deliver you. And he is a strong deliverer. And so I'm going to, um, uh, again, it's a part of what I do. You see behind me, my brand is is on the wall, activate, mobilize, embrace your freedom. It's just like what we do everywhere. So today I want to talk about a topic that um, we're going to kind of engage um, each other tonight, but I want to talk about a topic that I think is really, really important, um, um, something that I have even struggled with. So this one is going to be a little different than some of the other ones that I'll do because I haven't had much experience in those, but with this, I can actually relate. And um, tonight we're going to talk about breaking, um, breaking, you know, the power of sexual addiction, breaking sexual addictions in our lives. 
and uh, in the process of what that looks like and, and how we can get free, but not only get free, my biggest thing in life is helping people stay free. And so, um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. So this is, this is Brandon. This is Brandon Allen. And Brandon Allen is one of my spiritual sons um, here in the Kingdom Culture Movement. And Brandon, how long have we been walking together? Um, about six years. Why you look down while you say that? Talk to these people. About six years. Hey, y'all. Hey, y'all. <laughs> about six years. About six years you've been walking uh, with me. Okay. And so Brandon, basically forever, Scott. <laughs> um, so Brandon has quite a journey. Our relationship has had some... Some, some ups and downs. Yes. The downs came because of you, but they I mean, just <laughs> <laughs> but we had some ups and, and downs in our relationship, and a lot of the the ups and the ups and downs came from his struggle uh, with sexual addiction. So I know, of course, a lot of your story. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk about because I know that uh, some of this stuff happening was birth forth seeded in your life in your childhood. Right. Talk a little bit to the people about what happened to you in your childhood that you felt kind of like opened the door to this whole struggle that you that's been you've been dealing with um so one of the things that really uh affected me is is actually being in a situation to where um I felt like I where I was emotionally and, and physically abused. So this thing started probably from a young age. So uh, living in a household where there's different things that you see um, as far as um, alcoholic abuse, um, just mental abuse and, and physical abuse, these things that take toll on a young person yeah, really affected me. So um, when you're, I was young, I was kind of isolated um, and I didn't really have any outlets. And um, probably around the age of six or seven um porn opened up for me and it wasn't it was an accident like i ran across it and um how'd you run across it um i ran across i saw i saw stuff i saw like um uh, like honestly uh books that were available uh movies that were there um just to be vague <laughs> oh okay. are you being vague on purpose because oh, i don't want to push no, you no, in a no. place you don't okay. want to go no i'll go there. Okay, okay okay so <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so even my, my, my father had some of the similar things, some of the similar, uh, uh, addictions. And, um, so I would see these things that he had, that he owned and I didn't know what they were. And then other experiences from people telling me things, I didn't know what this was, but I started engaging it cause, uh, this is, this was something I saw he did. And, um, so probably around the age of nine is when I really first experienced um, masturbation and porn and um, it was scary at first because I didn't know what it was it was extremely scary but um, around nine I really started engaging in, in masturbation and, and once that door opened um, I, I would stay up late nights probably three four five o'clock in the morning um, watching porn every day like um, probably when I got 12, 13, 14, probably masturbating multiple times a day. And I, I, I did this and because I thought that this is what, you know, growing up felt like this is, this is what made me feel good. There was a lot of other situations that were happening at school, um, at home, outside of that, that I had very few things that made me feel safe. So sports made me feel safe. And I'm sorry, sports made me feel safe, <laughs> and, and and this and this addiction made me feel safe. So it was um, it was it was definitely something I did. I I I can remember there was a period of probably about three years where I probably would um, watch porn and masturbate probably at least three times a day, and um, it was in my teenage years, and and it grew into my adulthood like um, serious um, addiction to porn. Hundreds and hundreds of videos downloaded, hidden uh, collections of porn, um, things like that. So, um, let me ask you this. <clears throat> so, do you feel like now in your life, do you feel like you're free from, from sexual addiction? I feel like the one of the, yeah, I feel like I'm free from sexual addiction because of the fact that I understand that I was addicted. Before, I didn't understand the fact that I was addicted and I thought that I was um, okay or that I was processing. Okay, so hold on. The reason why I asked you that, give me a time, give me how many years that was then. Of being addicted? Mm hmm How many years? Because you was nine and you what? You're about to be 29. I'm about to be 29. So, so even if you're talking about 
even fallen out. Probably a, at least 20, 20 years. Twenty years of, of being addicted of this of this whole situation. And when did you get saved? Uh, I got saved, really saved. Well, first time I uh, accepted Jesus, I was thirteen. And then when I got saved, saved, and I really started following Christ, I was probably twenty four. So twenty four years old, loving the Lord, but for at least what? Four or five, four, five, four, yeah. four or five years in there, you were still mm -hmm. dealing, dealing with this, mm -hmm. and you 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 love God. So 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 okay. So it started there in your childhood. Mm -hmm. um, then how did it? Because that was personal. That right. was just you. You was you was in right. a room. You, TV. You computer. You. <laughs> What happened? What shifted when other people started getting involved with your sexual addiction? So, um, <clears throat> a part of that whole uh, journey in masturbation, um, I started, the internet came about <laughs> and things like that. So, I started engaging in these online relationships or these online uh, situations to where these older women um, were telling me at 13, 14, you know, sending me pictures. The Cougars was after you? Yeah. Well, Nasty old ladies. So they started engaging me in this process. <laughs> so I, I'd be 12, 13, 14, 15 sending uh, like my school pictures to these women and they'd be sending me back naked pictures or, or doing webcams and uh, older women like probably <clears throat> 20, 30 year old women and I'm, I'm uh, 14, 15, 16. And that was consistent. Like I, I, you know, relationships with these people, and I, but I still wasn't. Uh, to me, I thought I was okay because I wasn't having sex. Um, I didn't have sex until uh, I moved to California. So I lived in Memphis this whole time, um, and then I moved to California, <clears throat> and um, I was sixteen and a half, seventeen years old, and um, I met this girl, and she was twenty five, twenty six, and she um, took it upon herself to um, open me up and to sexually. So oh, she, mean, she took it on herself. She took my virginity, but she and she did she rape you? <clears throat> no, she was very aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so um <laughs> so um so so how was she again? You were what? I was 17, 16, 17 and she was 25. She was 25 and you were 17. Mm -hmm. That's a serious situation. I never knew that part. Yeah. So well, that's how I lost my I lost my virginity. Really? Mm -hmm. So I mean really isn't that illegal? It was illegal. Wow. But I mean, I was in high school, and um, after that, I ended up dating one of my teammates' mothers who were on my team. You know, I'm not gonna say, but she was older. Um, no, back up. So you said you're you're. you're the, 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 I'm, the, uh, I'm stuttering. On the um, the team you're on, mm -hmm. sport team you're on, mm -hmm. your teammates' mama. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say. You know, nah, where, you don't gotta go any further. Yeah, but, wanna, yeah. She she was um upper thirties, so forty. And uh, I was 17. Uh, I was in my senior year. But that's when... See, I, this is important because... I don't know if you see this, mm -hmm. but, I mean, that is literally you being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. I know, because what people try to say is, you know, you're, you know, you're a big man, you know what I mean, and stuff like that. So, you know, they think, you know, they, they look at men, stature, and stuff like that, and say... Oh, well, you know, you weren't taking advantage. You know, you just right. wanted it kind of thing. Right. But as a child, 17 or not, as a child, for an adult woman to be involved with you, I mean, then that, I mean, that adds into some whole other stuff to be able to start dealing with how you view mm -hmm. a woman, mm -hmm. right? How you view older women. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Have you seen that like that before? Yeah. Uh -huh. what's, the, what's the thoughts that come through your mind on that? So, um, really what happened is started a cycle. <clears throat> and um, for a while, I only dated older women, um, like much older. And uh, it was um, a lot of older women that I was having sex with, even to um, 20s, 21s. Um, a lot of older women, 35, 34, 39, 42, 45, like different age. And... Um, I, I, if there was a point probably around the age of 20, 21, where I understood that they were taking advantage of me and that um, they were getting what they wanted. So at that point, I shifted my mindset and I decided that if everybody's going to use me for sex, I'm going to start using people for sex. Wow. Because um, I, it was, it was, uh, it was, t I was tired of it. You know what I mean? Like I was like, okay, clearly this is what they want. So I decided, well, this is what I was been I've been taught, you know, sexually. So I'm gonna engage people the same way.
Wow. So what happened to you? Mm -hmm. I started doing to people. You started doing. And this is something I think is important because I think this happens in cycles of abuse all around the world in different types of abuse. Um, hurt people hurt people. We've heard it said before, but it's the truth. Um, some people um, in, in journeying through life, um, I, I try to create an atmosphere where people are really honest, especially the kingdom culture. We really work on that real hard. <laughs> it's tough. But we try to work on that around here about being really honest about where you are, that everybody has an issue, a place where God is working on them at. That's a really, really important part of our culture. So I end up finding out things about people. And, and one of the things that I've learned in my journey of helping people and serving people and coaching people through their freedom and their deliverance is that many people ended up in these spaces and in these places of doing different things because it's a cycle of what they've received in their own life. And it becomes this really ever-living cycle. So, so they begin to do that to other people who begin to walk in cycles and who begins to walk in cycles. And I think that's why I think it's so um, courageous of you to talk about this today because it's going to help some people be able to realize that they're in a cycle, they need to break it. And that somebody has to stand up to be the one that says, it stops here. I'm no longer going to go in this flow. I'm no longer going to go in this direction. I'm no longer going to do this. And I think your story is going to, is helping people right now. So, so you got into that cycle and you decided, Hey, now, I'm going to be the one. You guys still have time to invite your followers, share on Facebook and Twitter, and um, and invite as many people as you can. They need to hear this. And so you, you got into that 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 whole cycle. So what did that start looking like? My numbers went up, <laughs> unfortunately. Meaning uh, uh, many people have you sexual partners. Yeah, my sexual partners went up. You have an idea of how many? I never counted. Ballpoint. Honestly, probably... 60, maybe 40, uh, something between 40 and 60. Before, between 40 and 60 different sexual partners. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that alone. Can we talk about that for a second? Mm -hmm. So, I, I think that's really important to talk about because of the fact of one of the things that sometimes people don't realize in the midst of um, sexual addictions, um, particularly stepping into fornication, um, opening ourselves up to that, Soul ties come into play, right? <laughs> so, and and I think sometimes people, first of all, let me say this about soul ties, okay? Um, sometimes people think soul ties, and you heard me talk about this before, mm -hmm. only comes through sex, but if we really, really study soul ties, we can see that it's possible for soul ties to come through the power of emotional connections, right? Right, because many people before they ever move into a sexual encounter with an individual were already connected in their soul right. emotionally with that person, right. and this is why people who are even best friends, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, people that are so bestie, I can't move without you move, got to be careful because sometimes they even fall into these emotional connections and these soul ties. That so, so if we're talking forty to sixty women. Then we're talking 40 to 60 soul ties of people you're connected with and whatever stuff that they've been dealing with, the possibility of that stuff being translated into what you're dealing with, right? Because that's what, when God was talking about sex and even a form of sex, the purpose for the two becoming one. And we know when we do that outside of marriage, it still happens. There's a time that begins to happen in that process. So, I mean, that's a whole different piece to handle because you're not only struggling with your devils, now you're struggling with everybody else's, everybody else's that's been going on. I'm sorry, I feel you may be, maybe you ought to walk through this, but this is revelation right. to me for some ways because now some stuff makes sense to me even having this conversation with you right now on why some stuff has been such a process, right? Because for me, sometimes I was like, snap out of it. I mean, how long <laughs> do we have to stay in this same thing? How long do we have to deal with this, you know? And I've always, I think you can agree with me. You don't have to say this because the camera's here. Right. But I, I think I've always walked in a grace with it. Right, but, but at the same time, there was that point where it was like, come on, like, Come with it. But I would have never, it never hit me though. Mm -hmm. From that perspective, 40 to 60 connections from a soul to soul. Wowzers. Mm -hmm. So, so you're going through the process now. So this is, so uh, did you date? Did you like have committed relationships? So, um, so every, I, 
the, the funny thing is you would think that being um, uh, a sex addict when you're in a relationship you would you would cheat but I w that wouldn't happen I would um, I would actually avoid relationships as long as possible um, to avoid from cheating uh, but when I was in a committed like this is I and I said out well out this is my girlfriend um, I didn't cheat there were situations that I would become stuck in because of the opposite of it which was the secrecy of it that would cause different things to happen but um, majority of when I was out there when I was when I was in a relationship so I had a relationship in, um, when I was in Arkansas I had a relationship when I was at Cal State San Bernardino and those relationships um, that's when uh, majority of that time that I dealt in that kind of situation to where um, uh, I wasn't being uh, unfaithful or wasn't having a bunch of sex. In fact, my major relationship, I was, I mean, I, there were things that I did that were sexual, but as far as repeated intercourse, that wasn't something that I had. Let's talk about engaging. The, the, okay, what happens? Because you know, sometimes, obviously, in any type of sexual addiction, I, and I know from a porn addiction I, that I had, I, I'm very aware of the fact that okay, desires come up, mm -hmm. and it's like okay, I want to appease this desire. Right. A lot of times, for me, it would happen whenever I was going through something difficult. I was upset about my life. I didn't like myself. I was struggling strongly with extreme low self-esteem, suicide. Mm -hmm. So to cope or to feel better, then I would automatically go to a computer screen mm -hmm. and I would go into, okay, I'm going to move into self-pleasing. Right. And in the self-pleasing myself in masturbation, it gave me a temporary, the honest truth, it did for that minute appease something and to make me feel like, whew, yeah. But then I remember having feelings that came after that that was so horrible in the structure. So tell me about, okay, you did these things. Mm -hmm. You were going through these things. <clears throat> what were you experiencing? What was that aftermath like for you? You know, 40 and 60 women, there's going to be some aftermath stuff in it. What was that like? Um, so this is what I did. So there was a period of time that I was extremely connected to uh, emotionally to and that was uh, in depression and things like that. That's where a lot of my, the largeness grew in it. So I was sad, I was depressed. So in that switch that I did in my mind, I turned off my emotions. Wow. So I had to disconnect from my emotions to continue to do that. So like wow. a lot of these engagements, I would be an emotionless. Or like I wouldn't feel, <clears throat> I wouldn't get sad, I wouldn't cry a lot, I wouldn't get <clears throat> um, very water. angry. No, I'm okay. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would separate from my emotions because if I separated from my emotions then I could continue so I would go and be like oh man you know feel bad so I'd feel bad if I hurt somebody's feelings but it didn't keep me from doing something else and I never felt um I wasn't feeling conviction um there was a point to where I felt no conviction like I didn't even think there was an issue in fact I didn't think that I had a problem until probably a year ago I want to talk about one more story, and then we're going to talk about how y'all free. Okay. okay. So, um, this thing moved. You're saved now. Mm -hmm. You join Kingdom Culture, mm -hmm. right? Join Kingdom. You join Kingdom Culture. Um, what was that like for you? Talk to us just real quick about like, what even brought you here. Just real, real quick. <laughs> I was in a relationship with a girl. Oh, one of your pros got you here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, a girl actually <laughs> that I was dealing with brought me to the church. Funny. Um, and, um, I stayed, she left, uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I came and I was like, okay, um, the first thing that ever happened, um, I received a prophetic word. I never received a prophetic word before. And it was like jaw dropping, like, uh, you know, I, I was crying, hadn't, you know, it's only been a couple of times in my, uh, 20s at that point that I was really crying or vulnerable to cry um, I was crying I was open I was like oh my god what is this feeling I've never felt this before and not only the feeling but I never understood what was happening like it was a new reception and at that point I had just uh, probably about a year before that I had experienced Holy Spirit for the first time like real encounter like personal encounter so I knew that this was something that I was supposed to have so I was like I'm good I'm done I'm with it you know Let's go, you know, because I was trying not to not to have sex, and um, yeah. So, so that 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 moment was a great moment. Bring you into the house, awesome. You got connected Amazing. into the house, yeah. 
got connected in with me. We started building relationship. Yeah, right you started right. serving as your armor bearer. As my armor bearer. Oh, so yeah. you were serving with me for five years. For five years. You're supposed to be on guard of me in guard. prayer. It's supposed to be guard and, and protection. Um, and, and then in the national and, and all of that good stuff and just serving and you travel with me to different travel. parts of the country and, and all of that, right? All of it. So, but in that process <laughs> where we were supposedly building a relationship, there was something else going on. There was something else going on. Talk about what was going on with a female elder mm -hmm. in the church. So I was, um, so, I mean, just to keep it real, like literally from the day that I got here, um, there was somebody like, uh, I saw that I was like, oh, you know, um, I was interested in, um, one of the main things that, uh, apostle said when I first got here is that I needed time to process. So I didn't need to be in any relationship. So I told you to stay away from women. Stay away from women. Okay. He told, and he told women to, <laughs> to stay, stay away, away from, from me. I made it clear, didn't he I? Told them, Over he the told, mics. Yeah, he said, y'all yeah. leave him alone. Yeah. <laughs> He's processing. He doesn't need it. He said it. That didn't happen. So um, um, uh, what happened was I connected to a specific woman and um, we started engaging in conversations and the conversations turned into daily conversations, turned into um, a lot, a lot, a lot of conversations. And it turned into spending a lot of time. And then it turned into this big secret relationship. Um, and the reason why it was secret is because at the very beginning, from the start, we were told that we that it shouldn't happen. But we decided that we wanted what we knew better. We knew better. We knew that we could be okay, that it would be fine, that um, we would do what we need to do, and then, uh, but you know, we would just be good. But the the reality is, is that um, secrecy um, opens up the floodgates for everything else. What? <laughs> secrecy. <laughs> That's good. Secrecy opens up the floodgates for a whole bunch of other stuff, right? Right. In my book, plug. Secrecy. Play. secrets, lies, and leadership, one of the things that I say in the book is that um, a secret, the only power that a secret has a is secret. that it's a secret. Mm -hmm. But when you tell the secret, it loses, it loses its, power. its power. Right. But I didn't understand that. Mm -hmm. And I, what I thought I was doing was protecting myself and protecting everybody. So I'm like, okay. I'm, and I was used to isolation. I was used to people not asking me questions. And if they asked me questions... I was good at lying. I was good at avoiding it. Um, I had to lie. I had to lie how how bad I was hurting. I had to lie about what I was going through. I had to lie about my real situations. I had to lie about my mindsets. I had to lie about my feelings. So lying just become came something I had to do. Like it was a part of what what was coming out of me. And so when it came, when something I I thought was okay and I thought was good, but I didn't want to lose it, I was like, well, I'll just lie about it. Um, and that's kind of where that started. And it started, and then it grew a lot. So, so y'all started off with a conversation, but it didn't stop there. It with, didn't stop. It's an elder, female no. elder in the house. What happens after that? Y'all um, start talking with them? We start talking. We end up um, eventually in, engaging into a sexual relationship. And, yeah, it was way down the line. Y'all had a lot of car sex, didn't you? We, a lot of sneak, a lot of sneaking late night <laughs> in the car, um, you know, uh, stuff that, you would just, you wouldn't like avoiding like you'd be, nobody would know. Nobody knew. Well, people knew, but nobody really knew. You know what I mean? Uh, of course, things were revealed, and but even in the revelation, we continued to, to lie. So let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. So it became obvious That's to me spiritually that something was going on that was out of whack, right? Right. So then I came. I talked you what was that like the first time um we it was we denied um where we were how bad it was um and then we were just like avoiding it um but you know there was still some uh some repercussions from it the second time around because this is twice he came twice second time around it was like okay something's really going on this is getting crazy and we denied 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 and then it was like no there has and then it just it just became too much, and it it pretty much just spewed out. And so first time I said, "Hey, y'all, you cut this out. Something's mm -hmm. going on. Right. I really denied. You know, we like each other, mm -hmm. 
but ain't nothing really, really going not. on. Right. But then the second time came back and said something is, is this is off. Is, I remember the day. Yeah. We were sitting in Makai's room mm -hmm. at the old, old house, house yes. on Susie Lane. We were sitting in his room. I was sitting on the bed. Mm -hmm. I remember the one of y'all was sitting in one corner. The other was sitting in another corner. And I remember that day of confronting in the fact of still at that moment, even that day, y'all still lied until something kind of broke in the room. It just broke. And finally it all... It all came out. Came out. And that was probably the, one of the scariest days of my life. Not because... Um, not because I was afraid of what he was going to do, but I was afraid of what I was going to lose. And um, that that was a lot of my where my line came from to fear if people really knew me or would people still accept me or fear of if um you know would people leave me or fear of different things like that and to the point and fear you know fear and addiction to me it, it really uh, walked hand in hand because um I was committed to this addiction because I I was uh, susceptible to the fear in my life and the fear made me or not necessarily but the fear kind of uh, was the anchor to me remaining in this addiction. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was definitely something that was that was correlated. You guys still have time to invite your followers and share on Facebook and Twitter. Let's get as many people in here. We're going to keep this conversation going here and get to the place of where the freedom came in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was that was one. I just that's a juicy story, right. and so I definitely wanted people to hear that. But that's not it. That's not it. In, so, the, in the process, a child came into this situation. A child did come in. So not with the female elder. Not not. So with somebody else you was messing with while you was messing with a female elder. Well, we actually, um, that was a, yeah. So I, <laughs> I ended up in a situation to where I was, um, involved with an individual and uh, <laughs> she's on there. <laughs> oh, is she? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, involved with the, with the individual and, uh, it, it was, um, <laughs> definitely something that was, you gonna watch your words now? <laughs> no, that that it was it was no, nah, it was the truth is the truth. We it wasn't something that we were like uh, doing a bunch of times. We literally it was it was a, one one night. It was one night. You know, we thought we took the proper one proper night proper. only. And 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 ta da! <laughs> hey, let me say this. That's one of it's my she's my baby. Yes, so now baby. thank God. Listen, I believe that. Every child is a gift from God, no matter how they got here. They're still a gift from God. Absolutely. And Sanai is amazing, one of the most beautiful and talented and very <laughs> strong-minded uh, <laughs> children I've ever met in my entire love, yeah. life. I love that little girl right. with all my heart. But so it, it, that, that one-night thing happened, right. there's a child. There's a child. Sanai, Sanai Joy Allen, she came. So, so I have a, now I have a four-year-old. So in the midst of of all this going on, the secrecy, it birthed more secrecy. And, like, literally birthed more secrecy. Because um, uh, for about five months, I didn't say anything to anybody. Like, so... That's the night even existed. The night was existed. being cooking in the, in uh -huh. the pot. So nobody knew. <laughs> like, one... I didn't know. He didn't know. Mm -hmm. that was a, nobody knew. He didn't know, but nobody knew. Um, uh, people started finding out, like, randomly. Uh, because, you know, it's hard to, you know, to keep in. But eventually, you know, I told and then I started allowing it to be um, seen. Um, you know, and, and secrecy, it, it, it affects other people too. Like, you know, even like, uh, you know, my daughter's mother. Like, I, I know that being this, this big secret thing that I had, had to affect her, you know, as well. As well as a person, of course, that I was engaged with. The, the in secrets like these. So secret just begot secret, just begot secret. And it became like this... Um, this this gigantic uh, explosion, volcano eruption type of thing that kind of ran over and affected everybody around me. So after all of this, then mm -hmm. what begins to happen? Were there other relationships or after after mm -hmm. all this? Yeah. So other situations still um, came about. So me thinking like, okay, I'm good, I'm good, and not really dealing with the addiction portion of what what happened, the, the, the habit forming portion of what it was, mm -hmm. I would go these long extended periods being okay, and then something would shift. I gotta ask you this, cause I gotta know. Uh -huh. This is, no hype, not, I don't wanna make a proud statement, just a factual statement. Mm -hmm. 
the church you go to is a potent church. It's not your regular church. It's not a regular church. I mean, the power of God is flowing in. The, the glory of God is manifesting. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, you know, some church you can go in. and you. It's, to me, in my opinion, mm -hmm. it's easy to slip in and out of, the, you know, yeah. uh, doing whatever you're doing. Because ain't nobody care. It's no pressure in there to live right, to live holy. What were you experiencing inside of you was, being in these atmospheres like that? It was horrible. Um, like what? What was it feeling like? Um, it felt like uh, uh, it felt like <clears throat> a rotting uh, a rotting apple from the core sitting with a bunch of fresh apples Whoa. because um, the idea was is that I still had this fresh body because I knew there was something that I understood but the secrets were building and growing to where it was kind of destroying the core of who I was Damn. and um, and then being surrounded not just being but in such a close proximity. Uh, to something so powerful and uh, it was it was crazy it was tough it was tough because I felt the only way to keep it contained was to keep it a secret one more question before we get into how you got free mm -hmm. what did you what do you feel like you lost because of sexual addiction uh, time okay. I lost time I lost um, probably opportunities but um, I, I definitely lost relationships and I lost trust um, so I feel like uh, the one thing that I know that God's promises are God's promises but I feel like I could have uh, been to a certain uh, acquiring of, of, of her promises much sooner much much different rate than I am now you know I'm 29 years old and there's things that I'm going to come come upon but because of my fact that I stayed um, connected to this addiction um, that means that I always it was always going backwards. That means I, I was always in a backward, like no matter how far I went, I would always come backwards. I would always come backwards. And so that there's no forward movement, you know, and you can't go anywhere if you're not going forward. So literally I would be moving forward, progressing, progressing, and then coming back and people would be like, you know, there'd be statements like, man, you know, Brandon, you should, you know, I figured you'd be here by now or you'd be, you've done this by now or like, what, what's, you know, and you could, you could obviously see like, you know, after some point in time, something should have shifted her, you know, in my spirituality and my walk and my understanding of something, you know, and there would be little things that would uh, be, a, be, a, be happening, but I definitely lost time and I lost opportunities and, and trust and relationships. I, I lost the opportunity to be your armor bearer and then, and, you know, different things like that, but um, that affected me. These things affected me. How did it affect you? Like, what was some of the feelings you were feeling? Uh, disgust, um, distraught, like extreme sadness. Um, for about six months out of the, the uh, this the past year, like, a lot of, of, of shame and disconnect. Talk about shame. Like, what was that shame one? That shame, like, I don't know if, I don't know if people ever, but shame feels like consistent suffo suffocation. It's like, um like a house pressing down on top of you, knowing that you still have to get up every morning and you have to be able to breathe with your chest being caved in. Um, sh shame, like showing up to a place and knowing that it's nobody else's fault but your own. And yet you can't, it's like seeing something in front of you that you can't reach out to and have because of the fact that you decided to keep yourself into this place. Like it, like sh if, if I wasn't, if I didn't understand that there was more for me, or that, that I had to reach out to a place, I guarantee you, shame could have been the doorway to my death. And But I understood that, that I had to fight something. And nobody would, and, and the, because I was so good at lying, nobody would know. I mean, except the people who were, you know, some people could tell like, okay, something's off for Brandon. But like, like, I would hate to go home. It felt like how it felt when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So it reverted me back to my childhood where I would hate to go home. I would hate to go anywhere else. I would hate to do stuff because it never felt complete. So it felt like I lost, like lost something. Like um, I had a bag of marbles, and they cut the bag, and the bottom just fell out. I remember looking at you at one point in time, um, when we were at the not the current location we used for Pasadena, but the first one, and um, and you for the Pasadena campus, you you looked like you were in agony to me, like just like suffering. in like extreme pain. You oh. know what I mean? I remember looking, wishing. Like, there was more that I could do, but didn't really know what I could do because I felt like I had did everything I could do to help. So, I just, I just remember, and as a father, no father wants to see their child, both spiritual or natural, be in pain. Right. You know, nobody wants to see that. You know, today, 
um, um, today Jay Liss slammed her hand, my, my, my daughter slammed her hand in the, uh, in the drawer, um, in the kitchen and automatically, you know, she's crying. So automatically I'm like, Oh crap. Nobody wants to see their child feel in pain. So it was not, it was like torturing for me to see you in that agony and pain, but to know that really my hands were tied, that it was actually an inner decision that had to be made for you to get out of the space that you were in to go where you needed to go. Um, But that pain was real for you. That pain was, even thinking about it, like it just makes me like, it gives me like shivers, man, because I don't think, uh, like understanding like a, how bad your mistakes can affect other people and how bad that your mistakes can affect you and not just the fact that you're living in uh, mistakes but you're surrounded in in the same thing over and over and it's like it's like uh, you make this comparison it's like drinking poison expecting something different to happen mm-hmm. like you're consistently drinking the same uh, um, death drink and you want something else to happen and, sh- and it was like waking up to every morning like cheers you know like hoping that that this morning that I would feel different walking in the exact same way or making the exact same decisions or having the exact same mindset. So how did freedom come? Uh, a decision. Like freedom came in a decision. Mm-hmm. Do y'all hear that? Hold it now. <laughs> freedom came in a decision. Talk about that. What do you mean? Like it literally came down to like life or death. Do I want to choose to continue to be like this? Hold it. Invite your followers, share on Facebook and Twitter because this is where the freedom comes now. I have a statement I always make. Freedom is available. Why be bound? Get as many people in here. Even if you've already invited, share again, invite again, get people in here. Come on, talk. So it, like I looked at literally the things that I was doing and it, it, it came to one point to where I had to literally decide if this is the route that I wanted to go down. Like for the rest of my life or my future children, or the people who I'm going to connect with, or the people who are connected to my ministry, is this what I'm going to do forever? Like, and I had to decide that I had a problem, and I didn't want to have the problem anymore. And uh, it came to a lot of revelation, because I thought I was okay, or I would proceed, uh, push off that I was okay, or present that I was all right, nothing was wrong with me. And I had to accept that I, something was wrong with me. Something was really wrong. And that I had to make a decision and it, it didn't, I mean, delivery sessions were, you know, there, you know, and things like that, but it wasn't the delivery, the deliverance session that the deliverance session that shifted. And it was me deciding to accept the deliverance and being like, this is what I want instead of this. And um, so just, it, you know, you've been, as, I mean, how many doggone deliverance has you been? I mean, just in mass deliverance sessions with me, right? right, right. Because I'm always casting out devils is what I do. So right. you traveling with me, I'm casting out people coughing, you know, right. doing them to themselves, self, getting free. All right. kind of stuff is happening in the atmosphere. Right. right. But so there came a final decision right. that you wanted to accept deliverance. I wanted to accept it. I didn't want to just live in the midst. So it was like um, deliverance was there and I would live under the umbrella of deliverance instead of taking it as my own. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but like, I, so that's how I would get through like certain, I would be good under this umbrella, but as soon as I stepped under the umbrella, it would be like, oh shoot, I'm back at it again, you know, in the white fans. And, but what I had to do is decide that I didn't just want to live um, under this, this, this covering, but I wanted to walk out this, um, this lifestyle. So those decisions led to freedom. Freedom. Yeah. But did it lead to actions? Yeah. So one of the main things. So the actions. <laughs> it's so funny. Well, let's. Well, I'm sorry. Let's back up. Okay. So in this whole process, um, towards the the latter part of this process, mm-hmm. at this point, you've been stripped from all kinds of leadership in the house of God. Uh, yep. Leadership. Everything. So I, I've been stripped from all leadership. Um, almost. Why were you stripped from leadership? Like, what because was the purpose of you being stripped? Well, no, no, not not why. I know that, but what's the what was the purpose? Um, to be restored. To be restored. Right. So I, I was stripped from leadership, so I can focus on being restored. Um, not like a you know a spiritual spanking, but the <laughs> the understanding that how can I um how can I process and get what I need if I'm focused on something else? Um, and that was the core of everything else. No, was know, that painful? Restoration or losing the position? 
Wow, that whole process. That was the most, that was the painful. That was the, that was a lot of the agony. A lot of the agony was okay. coming from because it and, it and you know and that also showed me where pride was. Wow, and it also showed me um, uh, how much I put honor on positions or titles mm. and and really that what my heart was at where my heart was at. Hold it. So so sometimes people really will choose a position over their own freedom. Right. And that's exactly what was happening. I was like I didn't want to lose where I was at there's... or what I could obtain because uh, I knew there was more that like knocking on the door for me. So I'm like, okay, you know, it took me this long to get here. I'm not going to, you know, back out now. But and I realized that I didn't realize at first, but I realized that that was one of the the big causes in it. And it came to a point that okay, you know, uh, you know, free or bust. You know what I mean? Like I'm not like if if these things are for me, they're for me. But I can't get to those things if I don't obtain what I need to obtain right now. And it was probably like six months before that shift, like that mindset shift happened, where I was like, okay, I get it. You know, I was sitting here. Um, more uh, attached to your being an armor bearer, more attached to potentially being um, leadership or um, pastor. a pastor. Really, like I was being a pastor, and like this is what I wanted. I was after that more than I was after my freedom. And then I was like, well, you know what, God, you know, I need a relationship with you before I can uh, have a relationship with anybody else. And more than that, I had to consistently say that. I have to make a choice every day to not make the same decision. So let's talk practicalities. Practicalities. Let's talk practicalities. What were some of the practical things that you did, right? Because obviously you received your deliverance, devil's cast out of you, you know what I'm saying? All that great stuff. Um, but what were some of the practical things you did? I had to consistently say no and not no to um, necessarily women or people, but no to old habits. So like I knew that I knew that I could easily just be in a situation um, that could potentially lead to something. So I have to, I had to make myself say no to, okay, I know that when I wake up in the morning, um, first thing I want to do probably is check my phone or text somebody. But instead of doing that, I know I have to get in the presence of the Lord because if I don't, then I'm going to be dealing with it. So you found your triggers. Yeah. You found the stuff and the weak points of when you could see that you would get into the cycles of being in bondage. Right. Like at this point in time, if I was feeling this kind of way, so then you became aware of that. So then you you fought in those times? I fought. Like I talk to myself and uh, a lot now. And I, I did before, but like I literally, like um, even on my way here, um, I was like, okay, you know, I see you, devil. I see what you're trying to do. Um, trying to, you know, the distractions mm -hmm. and conversations, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know, so I say, I see what you're trying to do. I see what you're trying to take my mind prior to this place. And even trying to make fear spark up. Fear, because fear is a, you know, the root of a lot of the things. Trying to make me yeah. be fearful of saying this or doing this. But honestly, like looking at that and say, okay, all right, I see you. And, and understanding that I had to make a different decision in the midst of every single thing that popped up. Okay, let's get even more detail. Mm -hmm. So um, I know the fact that you had a lot of activity on your social media. A lot. So what they don't know is part of what you do, um, your call to the world is that you're an artist, mm -hmm. right? right? And so you're a poet, poet. am I saying right? Yes, spoken word artist. Okay, I don't know if it's, <laughs> it's both okay. one and the same. They're, they're uh, different. Yeah. Writer and, and, and spoken Okay, well, both. both. He's both. He's both. a poet yeah, <laughs> and a spoken word artist. And you, you can actually rap, too. I can People rap. hate on your rap they skills, they but your it. father believes in you, yes, so it doesn't matter. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, you're, but so these are things you, and so you're going into all of these spaces. Right. <laughs> you're going into all these spaces. Right. Where women are like, oh, Brandon, is this so amazing? Right. And so, um, there's something that I always tell you about going to those environments. What's some of the stuff I tell you about going to all those um, environments? One, uh, don't get people's phone numbers. Huh? <laughs> Say it again. Don't get people's phone numbers. Don't get people's phone numbers. Now, there's some people on here who say, well, that's just extreme. Well, that's just crazy. Kind of talk to them about how you might have felt that way before yeah. so and like, what that looked like for you. Now. So I did. I did feel like that before. <laughs> I felt like this is nothing. Like, it's conversation. Um, but what happens is um, it would be the conversations that uh, 
that I would get or that I would have and I start texting, you know, that would turn into um, more, that would turn into pictures, that would turn into, uh, well, what are you doing at 12, one, you know, because I was up, you know, or because I was it. So making a decision. And then if I had, uh, if I closed one door and then I got another number, it's like opening up another opportunity. So I wasn't never really, it was like shutting the door and walking into another one. It was never really uh, actually doing that. But, you know, and, and it wasn't just the women, it was me too. You know what I mean? Because I knew how I felt and I knew what I could get away with and what I couldn't get away with. So, you know, even in the midst of it, I knew if I felt a certain type of way, I could, you know, get a rile out of a text message. You know what I mean? Get somebody excited off of a, uh, you know, whatever. And You were looking for something in that because mm -hmm. recently, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute, one of um, people in my leadership I heard them say something, and I guess I knew it theoretically. I just hadn't heard a term about it before. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about not just sexual addictions, but love addictions. Love addictions. You got something out of these. You told me this a couple of, about a month or so ago, mm -hmm. that you got something out of the fact, even if you weren't into Being these desired. women. Say it again. Being desired. It was something um, that, and that came from the self-esteem thing and the insecurities from my childhood, but being desired, knowing that I could walk into a place, hit a stage, and then people would flock to me, or that I could, that my presence or my voice would be engaging. Like, to be desired, like, that's huge. And a lot of people don't realize how much um, that affects you. Like, everybody wants to be fulfilled. Everybody wants to be connected. Everybody wants to, um, to have somebody or to fill a void. And when you have this under, uh, this misconception of what loneliness really is, and that loneliness is only an opportunity for you to access Jesus more and not really a downfall, that you have to shift your mindset Come into it. Come on. And that, um, you said it again. You said loneliness is just an opportunity to access Jesus more. Right. Wow. Yeah. So I, what I thought, I, was, I thought I had a, a problem in the midst of my loneliness, but I didn't realize that it was an opportunity for me to grow in Christ. And um, I had, that was one of the things that, that I had to shift to. Like, so loneliness will cause me to be like, well, I know I can go here and, you know, and it would be, and, you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to like, trying to make, you know, light of it or trying to make myself seem like haughty or anything. But like, I know that if I perform somewhere, there, there would at least be one, you know, person that would come up to me and tell me that I did well or, you know, in my face or something like that. And that was fulfilling. It it fed that um, that pride thing, that thing that I said I really became aware of, um, that 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 pride um, feeling like a, a, a Rolodex of people meant something. The more people I was connected to, it meant that I was more important. Okay. So so you 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 you're, you're being more careful than ever right. with the exchanging of numbers. The exchanging numbers. Didn't you delete people? I block deleted, people. Blocked a lot of people. I consistently block and delete people, <laughs> even in the midst of trying to build relationship. Uh -huh. I, I I try to be like, okay, this is okay relationship, and then sometimes I have to be like, oh, I guess I made a mistake. And um, it, it's a consistent thing, even watching um, how how I talk and the things I say knowing what I can and can't do. Like sometimes I'll go even and delete apps off of my phone um, for extended periods of time if I feel like it's getting too much. And then, you know, sometimes I come back to it. But like, you know, it's just to be able to get myself in a place to where I'm not um, doing what I need. So it's a practical statement I always make is that in order to break old habits, you have to create new, new ones. ones. Yeah. And, and so in order for you to be able to step into a, a fresh way of doing things, um, you know, getting rid of the old thing, you've got to create a new way of doing things and embrace that. Yeah, one of the main things, though, that also happened is that I connected back to my emotions and I wow. allowed myself to feel again because in the midst of me feeling, I accepted the pain, I accepted the guilt, I accepted the shame, I accepted the conviction, and I didn't desire it. So a lot that um, was a portal to my freedom as well because um, I was so disconnected and um, detached that I had to be able to become uh, okay and then vulnerable and transparent. So you did it, you, you, you had deliverance, mm -hmm. the devil was cast out of you. Cast it out. And then, and then you, you did some practical things of mm -hmm. watching the doorways for mm -hmm. which these things got connected with you mm -hmm. and being careful in that. And then I replaced it. You replaced it. Mm -hmm. So talk about what your um, devotion life turned into. So, uh, 
of course, there's different apps of stuff that offers you um, opportunities to to read, you know, different verses and things like that. But um, I what I try what I became more addicted to was consistent prayer. So um, one of the things I would do, like I, before, I you know, okay, I'll pray this in the morning and things like that. But what I started engaging is that if I had an opportunity and I was feeling some type of way, I take a second and pray, mm-hmm. and I would allow myself to be more like, okay, I'm at work. This, you know. And, you know, I'm scrolling through my Instagram and I just seen something that just blew my mind. Let me take a second <laughs> and, and pray real quick, you know, or something like that, because it's it's really it really becomes it becomes it becomes. Are you going to are you going to walk down like to follow the rabbit, go down the rabbit hole? Or are you going to go uh, decide to stay stay out? Mm-hmm. So every time that, you know, in the midst of of course, I'm not perfect. And there's still times where I have to catch myself like, oh, look, you know, get get your life. But understanding that that that's happening, that it's a, a consistent process, that it's a consistent thing I have to say or think or do. Okay, one one more part, a mm-hmm. couple more parts. I don't know if you like it more, but uh, a couple more parts okay. is this: is um, how important was leadership? You know, and I'm not trying to make this a praise me session, so mm-hmm. don't do that right now. Okay, <laughs> just just talk in general. But but that, what was the what part did accountability, leadership? Submission play in your deliverance process. Yeah, your freedom. It process. literally was um, the outstretched hand to walk me um, um, to my exit sign. So, uh, what what I'm what that means to me is like if if I didn't really take on and understand and receive because I didn't receive uh, before. Like I understood there were leadership there and I didn't really receive the relationship like I should have. Like I didn't engage the relationship but engaging the opportunity and relationship and also the open hand. Um, a lot of people um, and, and I think this is where leaders fail. Engage the relationship. Engage the relationship. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and became, <laughs> uh, became a part of the process. Not just, you know, I, I more than ever was like what's next? When's, you know, the, uh, engage the relationship. Because I knew that there had to be some a positive shift, but I think a, a, a failure that a lot of time leaders have is that um, even in the midst of somebody's uh, struggle or journey, um, they shut off part of themselves to them. And if you close that door, they can feel it. No matter if you don't think they can feel it, you're like they they can feel that. And when you shut off that that part of yourself, even um, and, and you're and they're trying to reach out to something that has a block to it, you know, if you, and they have no access to, um, there's almost, it, it almost always um, keeps them from their freedom. And I think one of the greatest things about the leadership that I have is, is that um, even in your pain and in the midst of the things that you were dealing with emotionally, you didn't shut the door. Um, it might have taken you a second to to stretch your hand the way that extended as as much as needed because you had to process as well. But you never shut the door, and you allowed me to understand that that it was always open and, and able to be accessed. And that to me, it's like um, the difference between um, turning off your porch lights and then laying out a welcome mat. It's understanding that once you're welcome and you're you can walk into this, this absolutely becomes um, a, a pathway to freedom. So leadership was extremely, extremely connected to it. Gotcha. Okay. So you still in your process, mm-hmm. stuff comes up. Mm-hmm. You're still tempted. I'm still. Big booties tempted. walk by you. Every once in a while, your eyes look at it. Every once in a while. <laughs> so, 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 you know, and, and different things can come where it's still. So, so we always talk about, and what I tell people all the time is that the greatest trick that the enemy makes people, um, the tricks that he plays on people, is that when they're tempted, they think they're not free. Right, right. And that's that was, that was huge, too, because <laughs> I would be like, oh, I thought about the, you know, like, I would get close to masturbating and then I would stop and I'd be like, well, I'm already here. I messed up already. So I might as well, you know, do it. And that would be a pattern or something would happen. I'm like, well, I'm here now. But understanding that just because I'm, that I've made it to a point doesn't mean that I can't ever leave. Right. Like realizing that I, I mean, I mean, this is, you know, literally, literally, you could be looking at, typed in the website, looking at the porn, and decide that I'm going to turn my computer off. So whatever there's temptation, there's always a way to escape. Always a way. Always a way. And realizing that you just have to make it accessible and accept it. And that would, that's become one of the, the, like, 
you know, taking off and running. Like even if you, you know, you, you know, walking blindly, you realizing that, oh, I can open my eyes and then mm -hmm. I can leave out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really lastly, mm -hmm. so obviously you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. So again, these things come up, mm -hmm. but now you have, you're equipped with the tools to really move towards that. Right. But something different has happened because on the other side of you walking in freedom, you've experienced levels of restoration. I'm not talking about just within kingdom culture, mm -hmm. but just it, it, what, I don't want to steal your thunder, but talk about just what you feel like has been restored to you. Uh, my creativity um, has been restored. Uh, <laughs> I pride myself on my ability to um, write and to speak and to perform. And, and I was so blocked up and you didn't even, and I didn't even realize it. I thought because I was producing stuff that, um, that I was okay. But realizing that my capability to be more creative and have more to say and even to be able to have something worth uh, uh, accessing understood um, made me understand that the freedom, that freedom came in. Like, I, I could produce. I could write. You give me a second, I could do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But understanding that I, my, my creativity was restored, uh, my thought process was restored, my conviction was restored, uh, some relationships have been restored or are being restored, um, and even understanding how to love, like that that thing right there, because that's the whole thing, that's the whole picture, that it was all about wanting to love or wanting to be loved. I desired to be loved and I desire love, but understanding what real love is and that love comes in accountability and honesty and that it doesn't always feel good, but the love that's necessary, being restored in relationships and love, is going to be the the love that keeps you free. So um, yeah, that, that's amazing, and I'm really excited about the journey. Now, again, I know you got to run to work. So right. what I want you to do is I want you to take about two minutes and um, and well, let me say this, guys. We told this story today, and we couldn't talk about everything that had to do with sexual addiction in the amount of time we had. We'd be here all night. Right. Um, but we needed to be able to hit some parts of his story, his journey, to be able to help somebody that was watching tonight, either live or on the replay, to realize that, as I always say, freedom is available, why be bound? Right. You don't have to remain in secrecy. Right. And if you're in places where people are like demanding perfection out of you and are not willing to love you through your process, run for your life, man. Right. Real family really exists, right? Real community really exists that is willing to walk with you and stick in with you no matter what to help you. You do not have to be stuck in your problem and in your situation. Don't let your secrets destroy you. But stop and give an opportunity now to tell on what's trying to kill you. And when you begin to tell on what's trying to kill you, you begin to kill what's trying to kill you. Amen. Because through the power of your testimony and being honest about where you're at, freedom becomes available. You begin to be able to embrace it in a way you've never experienced before. Take two minutes, Brandon, and pray for people who may be stuck in that. Um, so, Father God, we just thank you right now, Lord, that you're literally giving us the opportunity to understand that addiction is there, but it does not have to be our continual problem. Yes, so we just thank you right now, Lord, that we're able to receive your freedom in the name of Jesus. Even in the midst of where we are right now, Father, we just lift our hands and receive Holy Spirit like never before, God. We understand that we can accept Christ, God, and deny the enemy, Father. So right now, God, we just take in, God, everything that you have for us, God. We access freedom, God, and we deny, God, slavery to temptation. We deny slavery to um to addiction we deny slavery to uh to the the to lust god and we just accept god your freedom right now in the name of jesus god and we also understand god that you father god you are the father of deliverance god you are the father of freedom god you god sent your son literally to die god to give us the access point god to understand that freedom is for us god that freedom is ours god um so right now father we step into that like never before god and we even god come against uh the misconception god of 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 denial god and even where denial has Thank tried to you. make us feel like uh, we don't have a problem or we're not addicted to sex or overlooking yes, our issues, Father. And we understanding, God, that Thank true you. God, truth, God, truth is the only way, God, Thank into our, our our purpose and our um, our destiny, Father. So right now, God, we receive truth like never before, God. We um, are vulnerable to you, God, thank so you, you can make us vulnerable to our purpose, Father. Thank and we thank you for what's happening right now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's powerful. So listen, we want you to know that um, this is what we're talking about today uh, to help people get freedom. But then we are part of, he's a part of my team. Um, and we, we have a conference that we're hosting July 
14th through the 16th called the Freedom Conference, the Freedom Conference um, here in Southern California. And um, we're going to be helping people get free just like Brandon got free. And, um, and not only that, we're going to be equipping them with the tools to help others get free and how to take both the prophetic killing and deliverance into their spheres of influence is going to be amazing. Matthew Stevenson, Judith McAllister, Sherman Dumas, Jaquette Dumas, Christabel Clack will be leading worship. Um, 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 even one of my daughters is going to be on the panel. That's going to be Marquita Bradley. She's going to be on the panel. Um, is going to be helping to help people know how to take the kingdom of God and freedom into the marketplace. She's an amazing casting director in Hollywood, and she's going to be uh, uh, there. And so many others that we're adding to it. You don't want to miss this. Oh, em Emily uh, Tingley yeah. from from Temecula. She's going to be doing worship on in one of the sessions. It's going to be amazing. Again, it's Freedom Conference, and I want you to go to the website. Sure com. Kenneth No, thank you. Yes, Kenny will be here. It's going to be amazing. I want you to go to uh, ShermanDumas.com and I want you to register. Get your spot, um, book your hotel, get your flight. No excuses. Wherever you are around the world, get to Kingdom Culture, get to uh, uh, the Freedom Conference hosted by myself, Sherman Dumas, and, and my brand. And listen, God is going to do something amazing for you. And I want you to be a part of it. And I want you to experience it. Uh, one more thing I'm going to tell you before you go. I'm going to show you a resource, so don't go. A resource that's going to help you. I'm actually about to give this resource to Brandon. But a resource that helps you. got to go, run. you got to go. Okay. So, so uh, this is a book called Pure Desire. One of the young women under my leadership turned me on to this book. And um, once I became aware of this book, I've been buying it, buying it, buying it, buying it, buying it, buying it. Um, I recently had a package of about six of them delivered. Um, and so I've been buying it, buying it, buying it, buying it. And this book really helps people learn how to triumph over uh, sexual temptation and addictions. And I recommend it highly. Um, I'm walking people through it right now. Um, Ted Roberts is the, is the author. Ted Roberts is the author. And the book is called Pure Desire. I'm giving this to Brandon, not because I feel like he's stuck, but we can always grow and become uh, greater and go to the next level. So that's yours, son. Go to work. Um, but, but again, um, again, I want you to, um, go to the website, register, um, uh, Thursday night, Thursday night, I'm going to be back again with another freedom talk Thursday night at 8 PM. One of my daughters in the, in the Lord, her name is Elizabeth Lawton, Elizabeth Lawton. Um, she's also been with me about the same amount of time that Brandon's been with me for about six years. And, uh, and we're going to talk about breaking free from alcoholism, breaking free from alcoholism. So we're going to deal with alcoholism and in drug addiction. And Liz is on here now. Follow her. Liz, sweet Liz is her as L I Z Z sweet. Put, put, say something again, Elizabeth and put some emojis up so they can know it's you. I want you to go and follow her. That's one of my, my babies. Um, she crazy, but she mine, and I love her so much. And I don't mean crazy like in a not so going to crazy house, but uh, Liz is something else. She's amazing, though. She's a giant in the kingdom. She is. She's my precious. And so I'm going to be sitting down with her. I'm going to be sitting down with her Thursday at 8 o'clock p.m. right here again. And um, we're going to be talking about alcoholism and how to overcome it and just what her journey has been with that. She has an amazing story. Uh, and God is doing some really great things through her. She's a rising star in the kingdom. And so um, uh, she's going to come and share uh, with me on um, Thursday night. Okay. So again, Freedom Conference, go to the website, ShermanDumas.com. Register now. It's going to be amazing. It's going to change your world. It's, I'm telling you, I don't, I'm not hyping you. Um, the proof is in the pudding. Um, also, uh, let me tell you this. Um, I will be in North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, June 2nd through the 4th, June 2nd through the 4th, Charlotte, North Carolina. You can also find information for that on my website, ShermanDumas.com. I want to encourage you to go there, excuse me, to go there and get the information. If you're anywhere near, come. I'm going to be ministering. I'm going to be prophesying to anything standing. You want to be a part of it. It's going to be a powerful, powerful experience, taking the freedom tour to different parts of the nation and the world. Uh, if you would like for us to come, go to ShermanDumas.com, the booking 
um, tab there, and uh, we can bring a team of people. I have about uh, a team of about three with me um, out there in North Carolina. One of the prophets here at the church, uh, Brandon, will actually be with me in North Carolina, and my dear wife, Apostle Chiquette, will be with me in North Carolina. So we're going to invade North Carolina. Uh, really, um, one of the prophets that trains the prophets here at Kingdom Culture, um, the prophetic teams here, Prophets Coletta McJimson, will be with me out there, and it's going to be amazing. So anyway, I uh, hope you guys were blessed by this, whether you're watching on live on the replay. Guys, share it like crazy. Let's get it to other people. Let them experience it. Let them hear about it. Let them be changed by it. Freedom is available. Why be bound? It is possible to walk in true freedom. Being a Christian does not mean perfection, does not mean that you don't have issues that you need to overcome. God has made it available for you. I want to create a safe place for you in your life to be able to say, I need freedom. And that's right. Somebody put it there. And who the sun sets free, and that's exactly how I was going to end it, is free indeed. Love you guys. Bye-bye.